Okay, so let's talk about ways, different ways to represent these clusters. So there are some of the common ways to represent clusters are as follows that one way to represent a cluster is that using the centroid as the representation of the cluster. So what we do is that we calculate the radius considering the centroid to be the center point and then also we compute the standard deviation of the cluster. So in this way we can actually estimate the spread of the cluster in each dimension and along with the radius we can use this information to represent the cluster itself. So the centroid representation works well if the clusters are of hyperspherical shape. So the shapes we saw earlier before were not exactly spheres. They were shapes that were elongated and were cylindrical sometimes. So they were not hyperspherical shapes. So if the clusters are elongated or have any other shapes, the centroids are not sufficient to represent them. Another way of representing clusters is to use a classification model. A classification model does is that we all know that in each cluster all of the data points have the same category. They belong to the same class. So it's fair to say that if we use supervised learning algorithm on the data and then we uh, identify those clusters and label them all according to each class, then we can use this representation of machine learning which would be another way to represent clusters. Coming to the next way of representation is that we also can use the frequent values, the most frequent value in a given cluster to be its representative information. So we, this method is basically used for categorical data in which uh, there are categories and uh, we can use the most frequent category which will also known as the mod of the cluster and we can use it to represent that cluster. So basically this method is used in text clustering where a small set of frequent words in each cluster is selected to represent the cluster. So we can pick the most frequent word and that can represent the text which is uh, represented by the cluster. So let's talk about clusters of arbitrary shapes. We've already seen that centroid information is not enough. How do we represent such clusters? How do we represent such elongated and not uh, hyperspherical clusters. They also may not be useful in any some applications and k-means algorithm we've seen that is may not be the best uh, algorithm for this. So what we do is we along with the centroid shape we attach another uh, information which is the standard deviation or the spread of the cluster. So the spread along with the centroid is sufficient to represent such elongated uh, shapes. Okay so let's talk about hierarchical clustering. Hierarchical clustering is a type of clustering in which we produce nested sequence of clusters which ultimately forms a tree called a dendrogram. There are two types of hierarchical clustering. One is bottom-up clustering also known as agglomerative. The other one is divisive or top-down clustering. So in bottom-up clustering what we do is we start from the bottom, we start from the leaves of the tree and we start merging the most similar pair of clusters and we stop until all the data points are merged into a single cluster that is the root cluster. In the top down or divisive clustering we start from the root and we keep on dividing the root into a set of child clusters until each child cluster becomes the data point itself. What I mean by that the singleton of clusters of individual data point remain and each cluster is actually the data point. So we continue to divide until each data point is in a cluster itself. Agglomerative, we start from combining the most similar clusters from the bottom and do it recursively until they're all merged into a single big cluster. So in agglomerative clustering, basically it is more popular than divisive methods. And at the beginning, each data point forms a cluster, also called a node and we merge clusters and we go on merging recursively eventually all nodes belong to one cluster so so it is more popular than divisive methods the algorithm the mathematical notation and the pseudocode where is of agglomerative clustering algorithm is given here and you can see it just uh, tells you the same thing nothing different so this repeat and until are basically loops and the if conditions it's just uh, one way to write an algorithm so let's look at an example. On the left side you can see a figure and there are different clusters in it. And we're looking at a problem uh, we, and on the right side we have a dendrogram of the same clusters. 
you can see the biggest cluster is at number four which is at the top and also now called as the root node of the dendrogram and the other ones are just the leaf so the important thing over here is to see that the closest clusters are merged into one cluster so and the smallest and the simplest clusters are actually the individual data points p1 p2 p3 and till p5 so this is representation of clusters into the dendrogram so how do we measure or how do we decide which clusters are close to each other so that they can be merged together there are different distance techniques which we can be used and we're going to study a few of them um, so let's start with the single link complete link average link and centroid so these are the different variations of distance measuring algorithm so let's talk about single link method single link method what it does is it, it takes the closest data points in the two clusters and measures the distance between them so the advantage of using a single link method for measuring distance is that it can find arbitrarily shaped clusters but the con or the disadvantage of using single link method is that it may cause an undesirable chain effect so imagine if there are noisy data points in the two clusters so they are don't they don't represent the clusters itself and they have nothing to do with the intuition or the background domain but they're still present and this algorithm considers them to be a part of the clusters and continues to uh, measure the distance between them and it, it forms a chain effect so what it does is that it two natural filters are uh, split into two and so this is the problem with the single link method so there is another type of method which we call the complete link method the complete link method what it does is it takes the distance of the two farthest data points in the two clusters but the problem over here although it solves the problem of one individual cluster now the right one uh, they're split into two but the problem is that since we're talking about farthest data points and we all know what other type of data points are usually far away from the domain are the outliers so this algorithm is sensitive to outliers it might take consider them to be a part of the cluster and do the same mistake like sensitive uh, single link method so how do we overcome this so we come up with a different a new method which is the average link and centroid methods so the average link method it compromises between the sensitivity of complete link clustering and the tendency of single link clustering so what it does is it basically averages the distance of all pairwise distances between the data points in two clusters okay so it pairs the different data point the data points belonging to different clusters it pairs them together and measures the distance of all the pairs and then it takes the average of all the distances in this way it gives you a better method than single link and complete link the other method is the centroid method which is also better the what it does is that it only measures the distance between the centroids of the two clusters so a centroid it, the calculation if it this clusters are made correctly and often they are and the centroid location and accuracy is actually dependent on the clustering algorithm so as long as we're using a state-of-the-art clustering method this centroid method of distance measuring should work the, uh, perfectly so coming to the complexity of these algorithms they are all in the polynomial time complexity which means that it will take them n square time to complete this task so the single link can be done in o n square the average link can be done in n square log n so the complexity is very high it takes a lot of time to perform this operation on your data set so we cannot use the, these methods on large data sets so what we do is we we do sampling we take small samples from the large data set and then we apply the same method so we can use other scale up methods like birch as well these can be used for this uh, to overcome the time complexity problem. Okay, so let's move on to studying different distance functions. So we have seen that the core fundamental aspect about a clustering or an unsupervised machine learning method is that we use, especially in clustering, is that we are measuring the similarity, which is the intricate feature defining these clusters and different data points. So 
whenever we are measuring similarity we are using distance as the only metric to quantify this relationship so both similarity and dissimilarity are quantified by using uh, by measuring distance between the data points so we have seen that there are different types of functions so let's look at them in more detail so given the in the light of there are different types of problems there are different types of data types and we have to use different types of functions distance functions according to the context of your problem so basically uh, we have seen that we know that there are two types of data numerical and nominal so considering the data type we use different types of distance functions and also they depend on the specific applications or the domain of your problem so the distance functions for numeric attributes or numerical data are most commonly named Euclidean distance and Manhattan distance. So the both of these are a type of Minkowski distance and this is the formula for it. The dist xi and xj represent two data points and the distance uh, between them is measured by summing all the differences between them. So we take all the data points, we subtract them and then we sum them all together and power of this uh, differences and there is a whole power which is the you can see h and this is the defining characteristic this exponential function uh, which differentiates between these two types of distance functions so if you're talking about euclidean distance the value of h will be 2 if the value of h is 2 this is how the equation looks like but if you're talking about the manhattan distance the value is 1 of h is 1 and this is how the equation looks so the important part to look over here is uh, in Manhattan distance if we take the h to be 1 the difference between data points there is a very high possibility that it might be negative so in order to prevent that we are taking the modulus so these bars these vertical lines around each subtraction are basically denotes the modulus of operation so the modulus operation ensures that there is no negative values where in this subtraction so in order to ensure that the function performs accurately the thirdly we have the weighted Euclidean distance the weighted Euclidean distance simply put is that we are multiplying it uses the Euclidean distance formula the value of h is 2 and we multiply weights which is a hyperparameter and that needs to be decided given the context of the application every time so the, we multiply certain weight certain numeric value giving a, some sort of you can say a boost to these differences so imagine you have data sets of very small values they are in micro cent micro millimeters and something so they're very small so if you want to measure the similarity it becomes really hard to work with very small values so given this problem given this context you see okay so Euclidean distance or Manhattan distance might not work because these values are extremely small and it's very hard to measure any uh, similarity or dissimilarity given the nature of this data type so what we do is we multiply these numbers with certain weights so when we multiply with them they become big numbers even though that does not affect the similarity or dissimilarity but it makes it rather easier to compute so that is when we use the weighted Euclidean distance. Another type of distance um, algorithm is the squared distance and the Chebyshev distance. So the squared Euclidean distance, so the squared Euclidean distance is that we remove the square root uh, from the equation. What it does is that it adds progressively greater weights on data points that are further apart. So the other type is the Chebyshev distance. So the purpose is that uh, if you want to differentiate them using one of the attributes uh, that they have to offer. So basically Chebyshev distance gives you the uh, ability to do that by using the max function. So what it does is that it, it takes the maximum value of the data point and it st states that this is the most different one from all the other attributes. So the question over here is that we've seen the different type of distance functions for data points that are numerical. What if the you have nominal data? And nominal data, basically, we have binary attributes. So binary attributes only have two states or values. 
and there is no ordinary uh, ordering relationship. So the important part is that in nominal data, there is a certain order to it. But in binary attributes, uh, especially when we're dealing with multi-classification problems, there is no continuity, there is no order. So we are talking about binary uh, attributes, for example, gender, male and female. So how do we measure the similarity or dissimilarity of binary features? If we cannot take the distance of ones and zeros because the answer would always be one. So the important part is to remember that whenever we talk about categories, binary attributes, classification, whenever there is about nominal data or whenever we talk about categories or classes, we use the one feature they have to offer and that is the frequency. Whenever we were talking about histograms, bar plots, we talked about frequency when it came to categorical data. So over here we're going to do the same thing. We're going to use the confusion matrix to introduce different uh, distance functions and we're going to populate the dis uh, confusion matrix with the frequency of these values. So let's see how we can do that. So let's say that we have a confusion matrix and of data point i and data point j. Okay, so imagine in the data set you have two features, i and j, and each of these features have many data points. And all of these values are either zero or one. So the first place, the first row and first column is populated by those attributes which have value one for both data points. So for both the features, count all the values that are one. And then we move on to B in which we for data point i, we count all the values which are one, and for data point j, we count all the values that are zero. And for the c part, we what we do is that we can count all the zero values of data point i and all the one values of data point j. And in the end, we have count both the zero values of i and j. So in this way, we populate this confusion matrix. After we've done that, we can apply different types of uh, distance measures to calculate the similarity or dissimilarity. So we're using the frequency attribute of these categorical data to actually understand the intrinsic relationship between the data points. So before we use any distance measure to calculate, there are certain types, there are two types of attributes, there are two types of, um, you can say, aspects that arise whenever we use confusion matrix for categorical data. So the thing is, there is either a symmetric binary attribute, especially when we are dealing with zeros and ones. So basically they have this equal importance and carry the same weights. For example, in gender, male and female are this, have the same weight. So whenever there is symmetry in the binary attributes, we use simple matching coefficient as a distance function. And this is the formula for that. So the B's and C's and A, B, C, D are the same values which we calculated in this confusion matrix. So we use those values in this function and remember this is for the symmetric binary attributes if there's a symmetry in these values. So let's look at an example. These are the uh, x1 and x2 two features and we have ones and zeros. So let's count these values according to the formula. So the formula states b plus c and b is to x1 to be one and x2 to be zero. So we're going to count them one, two. So there only there are two instances and we can do that. And the C value states x1 to be 0 and x2 to be 1. So there is only one instance. So 2 plus 1 is 3. And we do the same for the other A, B, C, D. So the only thing is left I guess is A and D. And so let's do that as well. 1, 1 and 0, 0. So 1, 2, okay we have 2, 1, 1s and two zero zeros. Okay. So this is how we calculate the symmetric binary attributes using the simple matching coefficient. So we have seen the symmetric binary attributes. Let's look at the asymmetric binary attributes. So the asymmetric shows that if one of the states is more important than the other value. So in this one, we're going to use the Jacquard coefficient. So for that, this is the formula. So the only difference over here is that it does not have the D value in the denominator. And the D value suggests that is the frequency of the zero zero values for both features. So the question is, um, let's suppose that by convention, uh, the one state one represents more important state, which is typically the rare or infrequent state. So the state which has 
more importance is the one that is rare and is infrequent. So that's how we can use this and that's why we do not include the zero zero which is abundant. So there are different variations we can use by adding more weights. So this is how we can use by using the jcart coefficient and the simple matching coefficient to measure the distance of binary attributes. So let's talk about nominal attributes. So we have seen that how to deal with binary attributes which only have two possible values. What if you have to deal with nominal attributes which have more than two states or values? What? So this type of problem comes when we're dealing with multi-classification problem and there are more than one classes in a particular feature. So how to deal with these classes? So the commonly used distance measure is also for to deal with nominal attributes is based on the simple matching method. What it does is that it takes two data points, xi and xj, and the number of attributes uh, is given by r. Since we know that the total number of attributes is given by r, and the number of values that match is given by, by q, okay? So we divide, we subtract the total number with the number of values that match in both the data points, and then after subtracting and div dividing, we get the distance for this particular, for the normal attributes.